Okay, I'm going to pray and then I'll dive straight in. Lord Jesus, we just welcome you into your home this Sunday, Lord God. Lord, I pray as I preach this message that you've put in my heart, Lord God, that um, you will speak to your people, you will speak to your children, Lord God, and you will impact them in a way that is unique to them, a way that only you know how to speak to them, Lord God. Jesus, I pray that this, this service and this Sunday, Lord God, people are drawn closer to you and that they build their relationship with you, Lord God. Lord, I just pray that this day goes or that my sermon goes well, and that you give me the words that you need people to hear, Lord God. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, unfortunately, this Sunday was, was quite lacking, but normally on a Sunday, we have some amazing praise reports from our kids. Our kids do fantastic praise reports, and they're normally some really, really simple things. A lot of the kids' praise reports are usually for simple things in our lives, things like their family, things like their friends, food. There's often food in there, especially violets. We get a lot of thanking God for cupcakes and chocolate. Um, and then, you know, I love my nephew, John. He often writes beautiful praise reports that are just thanking Jesus that he's part of our lives. My little boy tends to thank God for the world that we live in. And they thank God for things that are going well in their lives, the simple things. And the kids just seem to see the joy in just the basic, everyday things. It's completely pure, and they're completely full of love. And there's no doubt in them. You know, when Violet is thanking God for unicorns, she is really thanking God for the unicorns. And I am right there with her. I thank God for unicorns every day. And they are thankful and they're giving Jesus the glory in what we as adults sometimes find quite minuscule, quite unworthy of a praise report. And our praise reports are not unworthy. What we write is not unworthy at all. But what we write is bigger things. You know, Big John for a little while took, took a page out of Violet's book and he started thanking God for the little things. And I think we need to be inspired to do that. Thank God for, you know, being able to get out of bed in the morning and spend some time with family. Thank God for, you know, having a fantastic breakfast. Little things, we need to be praising God for these things as well. We can sometimes laugh at Violet's cupcakes and her chocolate and think, oh, isn't she cute? Isn't that sweet? But actually, we should be thinking, how amazing is that? This child has the ability to see God's blessing in something as simple as good food. Not everyone in the world could write that praise report. Not everybody in the world has the ability to write the praise report for a good cupcake. But she can so she does. An absolute inspiration. So this week's message I'm taking from uh, the book of Mark, and it's chapter 10, verses 13 to 16. And it goes like this. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone, will, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms and he put his hands on them and he blessed them. So it starts off, verse 13, people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. And when we first hear this line in this passage, I don't know about you, but my imagination goes a little to something like this photo that's going to come on right now. It goes a little bit like, you know, the families have heard about Jesus, this famous guy who's performing miracles, so they gather the family together and... They're going to wait in line and they're get, going to get their two minutes of magic, their two minutes of spending time with the famous guy, in this case, Mickey Mouse, in this case, Jesus. You know, the children are, finally ex are excited to finally meet this person who, who all the storytellers are talking about. Everyone gets their many, many bags. They trudge out to the spot where Jesus is, in line, they wait then, and they can see him at the end of the line. They wait their turn. And when they get to the end of the line, everything's going to be magical. Everything's going to be special. They'll have their quick two minutes with Jesus. 
and then um, a quick cuddle and a blessing, and then they're off to get their churros and let the children play in the park for a little bit. But actually, that's not what it was like. It wasn't like, you know, the families, all the mothers gathering their kids going, let's go see this famous person. The Greek phrasing of this passage states that this that the people bringing little children for Jesus to place hands on them, it would have been a rite of passage for the children. And it's actually something that the fathers would have had to do. It's not the mothers saying, let's all go out for a nice day out and meet this famous person. It was a, a, a calling for the fathers to take their children to be blessed by a rabbi. It was an intensely spiritual act where dads take their children to a rabbi and the rabbi would then bless that child and the father would declare that he is dedicating his child to follow God. In Deuteronomy verse six, five to nine, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. This is what the parents were doing here. They were carrying out their spiritual responsibility to raise their children in faith. We do the same here in our church. When we send our kids to kids' church, they're not attending a creche, they're not attending a playgroup, it's not a childcare facility. They are receiving the gospel. They are having the exact same thing that we're having in this room, it's just delivered in a more fun and interactive way and on a level that they'll understand. They are still getting Bible-based, spirit-filled, gospel-led teaching. It's just at their level. They're getting to know Jesus and they're building that relationship, that foundation relationship with Jesus. But verse 13 also says the disciples rebuked them. The disciples decided that the right thing to do at this moment, as these fathers, as these parents were taking their children to be blessed by Jesus, was to send them away. And the Bible doesn't go into much detail about why. Um, and today's in today's society, it can be a little bit difficult to understand. We're a lot more forgiving with children, we're a little bit more understanding. But when you look at the disciples throughout the Gospels, they are constantly challenged and rebuked by Jesus on their very worldly views of the world. They argue and question Jesus over everything. And it can sometimes feel like the most trivial things. One of those things being status and it's such a and I'm sorry that I'm being very typical stereotypical right now because we women we do do it we just do it in a little different way but it's such a bloke thing isn't it that comparison starts in the school year schoolyard my dad's bigger than your dad and then as you get a little bit older when you're about seven or eight it's like I can jump further than you can jump and then when you're about teenage, it's like, well, I can punch harder than you can punch, or my biceps are bigger than your biceps, or I can do more pull-ups than you can do. Or uh, even when you're adults, I can pull more weights than you can lift. Boys don't grow up, their challenges just change. <laughs> and yes, we women do do it, but we're slightly more subtle than the men about it. But in Luke, verse 20, in Luke chapter 22, verse 24 to 26, the disciples are having one of these arguments. It says this, a dispute also arose amongst them as to which one of them was considered to be the greatest. And Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one and the one who rules like the one who serves. Jesus answers to that argument of who is better, who is greater, who's got the biggest biceps, who's the best disciple, is actually it's the one who's the most like children. The one who serves, the one who is humble. They are the greatest, and we all need to be a bit more humble. 
So when the disciples are pushing away the children, they are completely justified in terms of society for pushing the children away because in society of the time, those children held the lowest status in society. They didn't matter. And that's what the disciples thought. But this is the part that I like. Verse 14, when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Jesus was not happy about this situation. The dictionary definition of indignant is, is being angry because of something that is wrong or not fair. Some related words that the dictionary gives you are acrimonious, aggrieved, angry, disgruntled, exasperated, furious, incandescent, livid. He was mad. He was not happy with his disciples at that moment. Imagine if you will, you are a parent. Now I know some of you are, some of you aren't, but just imagine that you are and you are taking your child to see Santa Claus. You booked it back in August, as we do have to do these days, and you've been talking about it for weeks, and your child has got their list, but it's not even about what they want to say to Santa Claus, it's about the magic of, of it all. You've walked into the area, you've fed the reindeer, you've got to the grotto entrance, you've seen all the twinkly lights, the magic Christmas music, the snow is everywhere, you've been given a few little treats by Mrs. Claus as you came, and you're nearly at the front of the line. And the child in front of you has just gone in and your child looks up at you with pure hope, pure joy in their eyes and the biggest smiles on their faces. They are so excited. They are going to finally meet Santa Claus. They're next in line. And then the elf comes out of the door and they look at, their, look at your child and they give a little... And they look at you and they say, Santa's gone on his coffee break, grotto's closed, come back tomorrow. Can you imagine how you would feel in that moment? Furious, livid, incandescent, exasperated, disgruntled, angry, aggrieved, acrimonious, indignant. That is how Jesus felt in that moment. Because to Jesus, he wasn't just sending away random children. They were sending away his children. The disciples saw children as small, irrelevant beings that had to be told what to do. But Jesus saw them as something precious and something to be cherished. Sometimes even today in modern society, we can have the same view as adults. We can view children a little bit like that. Children should be seen and not heard. There's a phrase in the film Matilda, I don't know if anybody's seen it, the old one, not the new musical one. And it's Mr. Mr. Wormwood and Miss Trunchbull both say to Matilda, I'm smart, you're dumb. I'm big, you're little. I'm right, you're wrong, and there's nothing you can do about it. And sometimes we have that view with children. Sometimes we can think, you know, they're sweet, they're innocent, but actually they don't really know anything and I know better. But children and adults don't have a one-way relationship. Children can teach us adults as much as we can teach them, if not more. Children have such a deep, profound spirituality and faith that seems to get a bit pushed out as we grow up and we start to become self-conscious and we start to become mature. We lose that just unquestionable faith. Jesus says in verse 15, truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive, the, anyone will who will not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. So how do we enter the kingdom of God like a child? How do we do that? We do it a bit like this. This is my other picture. So you've seen some of them. So you can see this was taken when we went to Spain. It was a few years ago now. Caspian was a little bit littler. And it started off, we were in the swimming pool and Caspian was a little bit nervous. He wanted to jump in, but he was a little bit nervous. So it started off, he had his rubber ring around him. And he was jumping in, knowing that he wouldn't go under the water because he had his rubber ring around him. And then it moved on to he would jump, but he had to have somebody to catch him. 
And you can see here that his dad's arms are out. They're waiting for him. And Caspian has got no fear at all. Look at the look on his face. That's not a look of, I'm scared, I'm worried, I don't know what's going to happen if I jump off the edge of this pool. That is a look of, I know my daddy's going to catch me, so I'm okay, I'm happy, I'm going to leap without thought, without second guessing, because my daddy's there and he's going to catch me. After a while, he didn't need his daddy to catch him anymore, but he did need to know that daddy was there. So if we go back to the screen that's been on, there we go. You then get these, where he was leaping into the water, but Daddy was still there. He still needed to know that Dad was there, and although he was jumping in on his own and he didn't need to be caught anymore, he still knew that no matter what he did, however far he jumped, however high he leapt, Dad was still there. So if anything did go wrong, if anything was a little bit suspect, Dad could still catch him. And this is what Jesus means when he tell us, tells us we need to be like the children to enter the kingdom of God. 1 John 3, 2 says, Our identity as a child of God means that we rely fully on God and trust in his plan for our lives. We are children of God. When Jesus died on the cross, he gave us that right. He gave us that title. We are children of God. God loves us as a father loves his children. And it's not like children he is looking after. You know, there's, um, my mom used to be a foster carer and she loved those children like they were her own. But those children through whatever circumstances had to move on. They weren't officially part of the family, although my mother very much treated them as that. And some of them still claim to be part of the family and she fully accepts that and that's fine. But as a foster carer, and as many foster carers are, you look after those children, you care for them, you love them, you give them everything that they need, but they are not your family officially. You are caring for somebody else's child. But then you have people who adopt children. And that is so much different because when you adopt somebody, legally, you are saying this child is now mine. They are part of my family fully, undeniably. Nobody can say otherwise. This child is mine, whether they were born into it or not. And that is what God does with us. He adopts us. He's not fostering us. He's not looking after us for a short time. He has adopted us. We have every right to be and to inherit everything that God gives us, the same as Jesus did, because God has adopted us, not fostered us. As God's children, we need to have a relationship with him, the same as a child has with their parents. And there are two elements to this. The first is that we need to be dependent on God for everything. When you have a baby, that small human is completely dependent on you for absolutely everything. For food, for rest, for comfort, for shelter, for cleanliness, everything. That child, that young baby is not able to make any decision of its own. It is dependent on its parents for absolutely everything. And as children grow up, their needs change, but they still look to their parents to provide for their needs. Even as an adult now, I will still talk to my mom every single day. I still seek her advice. I still raid her fridge when I'm hungry. I still get a cuddle just because I need one. I'm 37 years old and I still need my parents. I'm not as dependent on them as I was when I was a child, which is why Jesus says we need to be like children. Because God doesn't want independent children, he wants dependent children. Independence won't get us into heaven. We haven't got the strength to do it on our own. Despite how good a life you live, how many good choices you make, how many, you know, 
good things that you do, how many good deeds you do, you are not strong enough to do it on your own. You need to be completely dependent on God. He needs to be the first one that we seek in the morning and the last one that we speak to at night. In Philippians 4, verse 11 to 13, it says, I'm not saying this because I am in, it's Paul, Paul speaking um, about his circumstances, and he's saying, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And I can do this through him who gives me strength. Paul could not be content with every single situation through wealth and through poverty, through hunger and through being well-fed if he was on his own. We know that as humans, as soon as things go wrong, we go into panic mode. We go on, okay, how can we fix it? How can we deal with it? How can we manage this? How can I manage my money this month? How can I feed my kids this month? How can I do this? How can I do that? But actually, when we're in relationship with God, when we're dependent on God, it doesn't matter what's going on in our lives. There is a depth of, gr- there is a, a depth of understanding. There is a, a, a relationship with God knowing that he has got it. So it doesn't matter what's going on elsewhere whatever else is happening in our world, we know that God's got it and he's got a greater plan for us. So we don't need to worry. We can be content. God is with us despite the circumstances. He is there in the depth of our greatest darkness and he's there in the light of our greatest joy. He is an active, loving father and we need his guidance to get through this thing that we call life. You know, a few years ago, before I had my, my baby boy, um, my husband and I suffered a miscarriage. And while I was waiting to go to the hospital, I went and I sat at the beach. Um, and I put on a bit of worship music, and I just I felt God was sat there with me. And he just made me feel at peace. And it didn't make the hurt go away. I was still brokenhearted at this potential loss of a baby. I was still worried about what the hospital would say, about what they were going to do. But I just had this peace. I had this comfort because I knew that God had his arms around me. And that no matter what happened in this situation, whether the baby lived or whether the baby died, God was going to be with me through that situation. He was holding on to me and he was filling me with his love. If I hadn't been dependent on God in that moment, I'm not sure I would have been able to get myself up off the beach and actually go to the hospital and hear what those doctors had to say. But I had the strength to go because I knew God was by my side. The second thing that children have that Jesus wants us to have is absolute joy, trust and faith. Psalm 28 verse 7 says, The Lord is my, sh- my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and with my song I praise him. I've got an 18 month old baby at the moment and my husband and I both work so occasionally you know, one of us will have to pick him up while the other one's still at work and comes home a little bit later but when When one of us walks through the door, we open that front door and he can hear the front door and he peeks through. And when he sees that it's me or he sees that it's my husband, his whole, not just his face, his whole body lights up with pure joy. He gets this massive smile on his face and his body literally inflates. It's like he grows. He's like, (gasps) and he's full of joy and he runs into our arms and then just for extra insurance, once we've got him in our arms, he gives us a little pat on the shoulder. (laughs) But that's how we should feel when we greet God. That's how we should feel every morning when we wake up and we greet God into our lives. It should be pure joy. It should be complete trust and faith in the one that we call Father. You are a child of God. When you were born, you were given your family's name. Before you were even named by your parents, you were named into their family. A lot of bumps are called baby, whatever your last name is. You know, both my boys were baby chum before they were ever Caspian or Kewin. Because when they're a bump, 
people don't know what you're going to call them. People don't know what their names are going to be called, but they do know that they are going to be part of your family. My baby boys were chums before they were anything else. It's the same with God. Your identity is in him. John 15 verse 16 says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Psalm 139, 13 to 16 says, for you created my for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in this secret place. And when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them ever came to be. God knows and loves everything about you. Because our identity is in Christ, we've got nothing to prove to anyone else or to God. When God sees us, he sees us through the eyes of his son, which means we are blameless, we are sinless because we have accepted Jesus into our hearts. Society may tell you that you are ugly Society may tell you that you are not worthy, that you don't fit in, you're not skinny enough, you're not muscly enough, you're not outgoing enough, you're not smiley enough. God says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. He loves you. Doesn't matter whether you are thin, fat, or somewhere in between. Doesn't matter if you've got a six pack or just a bit of a jelly down there. It doesn't matter whether you are confident or whether you are shy. It doesn't matter what you do or what you say. God loves you. Placing your identity in Jesus takes the pressures of society off your life. It, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 10, This is why for Christ's sake I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardship, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. When we claim our identity as a child of God, we are strong in our weakness because he gives us that strength. And the final line of the verse in Mark that we were talking about, it says, and he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. Jesus wants to take you in his arms. He wants to place his hands on you, and he wants to bless you. And when we're in his arms, we need to take refuge in those arms. We need to rest there, just as a child takes refuge in the arms of their parents. You know, this morning there was a few kids, mine included, who were sat in their mother's lap, and their mothers had their arms around them. And those kids were comfortable, they were safe, and they were secure, because they knew that their parents had a hold of them. And that's how we need to feel when we are wrapped in the arms of Jesus. He loves you, and nothing and nobody can take that away from you. When we rest in the arms of Jesus, he blesses us with the kingdom of heaven, with our home and with our refuge, inherited by the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. So in conclusion, Matthew 10 te teaches us that we have a deep responsibility to nurture our own children and the next generation in faith. But that we have to be like children ourselves. We have to depend upon and absolutely have faith, trust, and joy in God as a child has faith, trust, and joy in their parents. And when we accept that childlike act and we accept that we are children of God, we can then rest in the arms of our Father as we inherit the kingdom of God. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, I just thank you that you love us so deeply and so wholeheartedly that we can come to you as children, that we don't have to worry about the outside world and we don't have to worry about what else is going on in our lives because you are our Father and we can just give it to you Lord, help us to be more childlike. Help us to come to you in the deepest, darkest moments of our lives and the brightest, greatest moments of our lives and everything in between. Lord, I pray that you will guide us, 
and that you will give us the knowledge that you hold us no matter what is going on in our lives, no matter who we think we are. We thank you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made and that is how you see us. I know that when my child does things wrong and he makes mistakes, I'm disappointed, but it doesn't change how I love him. And Lord, let me and everyone in this room and everyone who can hear my voice know that no matter what we do, no matter how bad things get, the mistakes that we make, doesn't stop you loving us. We just need to come to you and ask for your forgiveness and you will throw your arms around us and give us all your love. Lord, we thank you for that and we worship you in your holy name. Amen. Free at last. Free at last he has ransomed.